Hey Jay, how's it going? Hey, how hey. are you? Look what I've got. Oh, yo, 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 yo. What is that? Shiraz. And you know where that's from? Shiraz? <laughs> Iran. Iran? Wait a minute. There's a problem here. You can't have alcohol from Iran. <laughs> Not from Iran. What are you doing with that? Look at this. This is Iranian wine, Shiraz wine. And what's well Mel doing with Iranian wine? This is an oxymoron, people. You cannot have wine from a Muslim country that is still being produced today unless maybe historically this was not a problem. And that's what Mel is going to be doing today. So, Mel, this is this is a this really is a problem. How can Muslims look at you pouring a wine which comes from Iran, even though that may not itself, that bottle may not come from Iran, but this is the Iranian wine in a country that is predominantly Muslim, yet we know today that wine is prohibited. Let's go to the Quran. I'm just going to put up some verses here because in the Quran, it's very clear in chapter 2, verse 219. This is what it says. They ask you, O prophet, about intoxicants and gambling. Say, this is Muhammad speaking, there is great evil in both as well as some benefit for people, but the evil outweighs the benefit. That's chapter 2, verse 219. In chapter 5, verse 90, it's even stronger. O believers, intoxicants, gambling, idols, and drawing lots for decision are all evil of Satan's handiwork. So shun them so you may be successful. That's in chapter 5, verse 9. We go back to that same chapter and go to the next verse and it says this, Satan's plan is to stir up hostility and hatred between you with intoxicants and gambling and to prevent you from remembering Allah and praying. Will you not then abstain? In the traditions, we could go to Al-Buhari. There's so many. I'm just going to point to one here from Al-Buhari, uh, volume 69, hadith number 481. It says, Ibn Umar narrated, this is the, this, this is the Isnad. Allah's apostle said, whoever drinks alcohol, drinks in the world, and does not repent before dying, will be deprived of it in the hereafter. In other words, if you drink alcohol, Mel, you're not going to heaven. You're not going to paradise. So this is very serious. How then can you be there pointing to a bottle of wine in the 21st century coming from a Muslim context, unless perhaps this didn't always mean that, or maybe the Quran was not as strong on this position. Over to you, Mel. Let's see what you have to say. Because you're going to throw some things at us that I've not heard before. Yeah. So the history of um, Islam's attitude, relationship, if you like, with alcohol is, is a bit of a roller coaster ride. Um, we've assumed up to now that um, alcohol was abrogated from the 7th century. They've They've looked at the verses and said, right, this is the verse that's abrog ever abrogating all the other verses. But what we'll see today is evidence that Muslims had different attitudes to alcohol down through the centuries. They were willing to tolerate it in some eras. Some eras they banned it, sometimes successfully, sometimes unsuccessfully. Um, and we'll also see that there, when they were drinking alcohol, it wasn't always in a moderate fashion, the way that the Quranic verse mentions. In fact, they were... Uh, so um, fond of alcohol that even the Christians were commenting about their um, fondness for alcohol and shocked actually to see how much they drank. Now, Christians um, have got a mixture of attitudes to alcohol as well, in fairness. And I, I think if we looked at the Quran as a, as a collection of opinions towards alcohol, then there's no problem. But once you start abrogating and saying this is the, the verse and the the verses that allowed alcohol are are no longer in place hmm. then islam has got a major problem so i think in the early days um, muslims were an awful lot more relaxed about this issue so okay. without further ado but before you to... your powerpoint i think also we need to say that almost every i don't know of any muslim all other than very liberal muslims but any muslim i have met is very clear 
you are not to touch alcohol. This is right across the board, regardless of what whether the Quran has a position here and there, whether or not you exegete it this way or exegete it that way. Every Muslim that I have met is absolutely against alcohol for religious reasons, not for health reasons, not for hygienic reasons, for religious reasons. So if that is the case, and this is from every Muslim I know, then they talk to me about it. It's always because Allah dictated this. It's because the Quran stipulates this. The prohibition is in the Quran itself. Therefore, it comes from Allah himself. That's why they do not touch alcohol. Yet you're going to tell us, hold on a minute. There's a history behind this. There is a history and they're in for a shock when they look at that history. <laughs> so let's let's get started. Okay, so um, as you can see, there's a, a couple of bottles of Shiraz. Um, the Shiraz, as, as you can see in the picture, are actually um, they're from Spain, I think, in both cases. Um, so this is going to be uh, an inquiry, first of all, about why there are French wines and Spanish wines and Australian wines that have Shiraz on the label. Is it because the vine comes from Iran or is it because the reputation of the Iranian wine was so good that the Europeans wanted to imitate and emulate that wine? So, um, what's interesting is prior to Iran becoming um, a Muslim country, Zoroastrianism um, had an opinion about wine, and uh, it actually was quite a moderate opinion. If one looks at the internal Iranian evidence, uh, a new image of the importance of wine in classical Iran emerges. The most interesting of these texts is one called the Spirit of Wisdom from the 6th century CE, so this is just before um, the rise of Islam. One chapter discusses how wine can bring one's good and bad dispositions and argues that those who drink it in moderation benefit in enhanced awareness and intellectual facility. This that is begotten will be remembered and goodness will take place in thought and it will increase the sight of the eye and hearing of the ear and the speech of the tongue. And doing work and managing will proceed faster. Relative temperance, however, is emphasized, but anyone who drinks wine must be conscious to drink in moderation since through moderate drinking of wine, this much goodness will come to him because food will be digested and kindle fire of the body and increase intelligence and the mind and seed and blood and reject torment. So essentially, in Zoroastrianism, which would have been the, the religion of Iranians prior to Islam, it was a, a very mature attitude towards alcohol. Alcohol can be good for you as long as you drink it in moderation would be a good summary. Now, was Islam anti-wine at the time of the conquest of Iran? An early Chinese record tells us quite clearly that the Umayyads didn't seem to have a problem with wine. So we turn to Sefu Yua Angui, which is the largest encyclopedia compiled during the Chinese uh, Song Dynasty. If that's 960 to 1279. It was the last of the four great books of song. The previous three have been, been published in the 10th century. And there's an entry for during the reign of Caliph Suleiman, 715 to 717. So here is what it says. And this is from the Chinese point of view. Receiving invoice, presenting golden silk woven robe, jewelry decorated jade and luxurious wine cup as tributes from the king of Dashi, which would be the Taiyeye, named He Mimoni. So we can see there that the maids were comfortable with wine. They, they thought that a wine cup, a luxurious wine cup, would be a nice gift to give the Chinese. This doesn't indicate uh, an aversion to alcohol. Now feel free, Jay, to come in at any point. Well, you... this, is, this is exactly what we're looking for. Whenever we're, at, we're looking at, uh, in this case, a theological precept or a practice that is based on a theological precept that comes out of scripture itself. Yet when we go back to the very people who created or who were the first repository of Islam, you know, the first caliphate, which would be the Umayyad caliphate, which went uh, from uh, 651 up till 749, roughly 100 years. We're now in 715 to 717. That's in the 8th century. This is a long time after Muhammad. Uh, you know, we're talking about 60, 70 years after, or 80 years after Muhammad. 
And yet here we find uh, that the Chinese see them drinking wine quite readily. Obviously, this was not a problem in the 8th century, not during the Umayyad dynasty, the first real strong Islamic dynasty after the four rightly guided caliphs. Proof that there is a problem with this theology and also I would suspect there may be a problem with these verses in the Quran. Yeah. Um, so, so did winemaking end in Iran once Islam um, took over under the Abbasids? And the short answer is no. Um, in order for you to have vineyards, you need to keep the vines in place. It takes a lot of love. Um, I was at a wine tasting event there recently, and uh, the thing that I, I got from it was that the, the people who grow vines absolutely love their vines like children. They look after them, they nurture them, and it's a family tradition. It goes down through the centuries. So if we find any um, instances of wine being produced in Iran down through the centuries, there's usually centuries of that going back in time. So it's a long tradition. It doesn't, you, you can't just um, start and stop traditions of, of wine production. It's, 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 a, it's a long commitment. Um, so Shiraz wine, but isn't Shiraz in Iran? This is what we started with. Um, well, here's Shiraz. It's in southwestern Iran. Uh, I found this article in BBC, uh, BBC News, and someone has actually done the, the research on this. And the question they wanted to know was, why do we call some of our wine Shiraz? Is it because the vine comes from Iran? That was really the question. Um, I, I'll try not to read all of this here, but um, the, the author of this article says that I remember my father bringing in the grapes and putting them in a big clay vat, says California-based wine maker Dariush Khalidi, recalling his childhood in pre-revolutionary Iran. So there, there you see automatically that prior to 1979, um, people were still making wine in Iran. He says, I would climb on top and smell and enjoy the wine. His family was from Shiraz, a fabled city in southwestern Iran, whose name was once synonymous with viticulture and the poetry and culture of wine. He remembers happy evenings when the family would gather, sipping wine from clay cups and reciting lines from the 14th century Persian poet Hafez. It wasn't just about drinking wine, he says, it was an adventure. Now we'll, we'll refer to Hafez later, but it's most popular um, poets in Persian history. The world uh, Dariush remembers came to an end in 1979 when Iran's new Islamic rulers banned alcohol. They shut down wineries, ripped up commercial vineyards and consigned to history a culture stretching back thousands of years. Now, um, it it's also mentions that um, grape cultivation has happened in Iran since two and a half thousand years BC, so a long time. Um, by the 14th century, Shiraz wine was immortalized in the poetry of Haf Hafez, whose tomb in the city is still venerated today. It's true the poetry that Europeans learned about the, the glories and uh, beauty of Shiraz wine, and um, this is largely the reason why we have um, Shiraz written on the bottles today. Um, so uh, we have from him, the poet, Last night, the wise tavern master deciphered the enigma, gazing at the lines traced in the cup of wine, he unraveled our awaiting fate. In the six, 1680s, a French di diamond merchant, Jean Chardin, traveled to Persia to the court of Shah Abbas. He attended elaborate banquets and recorded the first European account of what Shiraz wine tasted like. So, Clearly, they're still drinking wine in the 680s there. It was a very specific red, says French historian and Chardon expert Francis Richards. It was a wine with good conservation because generally the local wines very quickly turned to vinegar. So they were obviously very impressed with the wine. Um, but is there a connection between the dark red wine that smells like musk, immortalized by Hafez, and the Shiraz wine drunk across the world today? So to cut a long story short, there, there's a legend that vines were brought from Iran to France um, at the time of the Crusades. So this is essentially a local legend in France. 
but there was a DNA uh, testing done in 1998 that ruled this out. Um, so it seems to be that the the vines that are referred to as Shiraz in France and Australia and so forth are just in honour of the Shiraz wine, uh, rather than it being a direct connection. But it just shows you that how how valuable that wine was considered, or, not, or how how good that wine was. So while the vines in southern France do not come from Shiraz, the fact that the French, the Crusader tales, and later Australian vine growers with the adoption of the name Shiraz, attempted to associate their vines with Shiraz in Iran is testament to the huge reputation of Iranian wine immortalized by Hafez in the 14th century. So Shiraz wine is named after its namesake, a city in Iran. So this is that tale. I thought it'd be interesting to have a look at Hafez. Now, the thing about this is I, I find it hard to believe that a poet who is talking about the, um, the delights of wine could become popular in a country where no one drank wine. Would, would you find that hard to believe, yeah. Jay? Obviously because of his notoriety, obviously because of the fact that he's a poet, obviously because his poetry uh, points to the beauty and the majesty of this wine from that area of the world. This suggests very clearly that this was not a problem in the 14th century. Yeah, I would say that it shows, first of all, that people were tolerant of it. And also I'd say that quite a few um, had um, an experience of it. They had a familiarity with it so they could relate to the sentiments in the poem. So he's a 14th century um, Persian poet, a Sufi, and he's from the city of Shiraz. He primarily wrote gazelles which were lyrical poems and that express both the pain of loss and the beauty of love in spite of that loss um, in his odes he deals with love wine and taverns all presenting ecstasy and freedom from restraint whether in actual worldly release or in the voice of the lover speaking of divine love so he describes a society where drinking alcohol is tolerated if frowned upon by hypocrites so this is one of the targets of these poems while the pious few might frown on drinking alcohol, it is evident that Iranians were still wine lovers in his day. That he is familiar with wine and taverns is in itself revealing of the fact that these existed in Iran in the 14th century. So that's one takeaway from the, all of this. He castigates the pious hypocrites. Love wants to reach out and manhandle us, break all our teacup talk of God. So the teacup talk of God is basically the, you know, the the people who basically do, do not touch alcohol, okay? He sees wine as a portal to the divine. He says, to beg at the door of the wine house is a wonderful alchemy. If you practice this soon, you will be converting dust into gold. The fact that his poetry was not shunned, but hugely popular among Iranians to this day, suggests that its themes resonated with Iranians who could relate to the themes of wine and taverns. Here is a poem which is called, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Oh, friends, don't blame me for this broken heart. Inside me, there is a great jewel and it's to the jeweler's shop I go. I presume it means to heaven. Even though to pious drinking wine is a sin, don't judge me. I use it as a bleach to wash the color of hypocrisy away. All that laughing and weeping of lovers must be coming from some other place. Here all night I sing with my wine cup then moaned for you all day. If someone were to ask Hafiz, why do you spend all your time sitting in the wine house door? To this man, I would say, from there standing, I can see both the path and the way. Do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I mean, there is, it's, to, to, be, to be clear, there is some injunctions against wine. I'm wondering if the what he's referring to is the drunkenness, the fact that too much wine leads to drunkenness, which we have in Christianity as well. Paul, remember, tells Timothy to drink wine for his stomach. Jesus, remember, the very first uh, the very first miracle he did was to turn water into great wine at the at the party. So, therefore, in the Bible, it's very clear that you are permitted to drink wine, but you're not permitted to go to excess. And this could be what this is referring to here. It's not that wine was prohibited it was drunkenness that is prohibited those who stay at the door those who go to the wine house 
as it is today. We have the same thing, especially here in the United States, not so much there in Britain and in, in uh, Ireland where you're from, but here in America, it's very much frowned upon to go beyond and to get intoxicated. Drinking wine is not the problem itself. It is the intoxication. It's going too far. Uh, I remember yeah. when I lived in France, goodness sakes, everywhere we went in France, the first thing they put on the table is wine. And you have wine just for table. Everybody, my wife who hates wine, she doesn't like the taste of it, had to learn to drink wine. I like wine, so it was not a problem for me. But you can't go almost anywhere in France without having a bottle of wine, not water, but wine to wash down your food. So, but if you go to France and you see people who are drunk, that's frowned upon, and it could be that's what this re per this poem is referring to. Possibly, yep. Yeah. Um, here's another one. He, um, he says, "From the large jug, drink the wine of unity, so that from your heart you can wash away the fut futility of life's grief. But like this large jug, still keep the heart expansive. Why would you want to keep the heart captive like an unopened bottle of wine?" So I really love that poem. It's you know, it's about the kind of He's kind of uh, using the metaphor of wine there to kind of uh, represent the idea of being open and, you know, living life and so forth. Um, he goes on to say, with your mouth full of wine, you are selfless and you will never boast of your own abilities again. Be like the humble stone at your feet rather than striving to be like a sublime cloud. The more you mix colors of deceit, the more colorless your ragged, wet coat will get. So he's saying that Rather than trying to puff yourself up, you know, far better to learn to be humble um, than to be think you're above everyone else. And so he's he's definitely thinking of certain people in in his society. Um, and he thinks maybe they could do with actually um, having a glass of wine and uh, chilling out a little bit and maybe not thinking so much of themselves, but of others, you know. The very first um, line says it right there. Go back to the very first line and uh, you will see. Uh, the one before that slide before that so drink the wine of unity this is to be something you do with other friends this is to be something you do in a group and that's why he's saying have a large drunk drink it with friends this is what you do when you're with friends so it's obviously he is he is confronting these pious people who are frowning upon it uh, because they do not know about this unity that wine brings yep. Okay, so he says, uh, connect the heart to the wine so that it has body, then cut off the neck of hypocrisy and piety of this new man. Be like Hafez, get up and make an effort, don't lie around like a bum. He who throws himself at the beloved's feet is like a workhorse and will be rewarded with boundless pastures and eternal rest. So I think that's that's a wonderful sentiment. You know, he's not saying to be, be like a bum, but he's actually saying that, you know, have a bit of life about you and uh, this is actually the thing of god it's not as long as you don't go over the top so that was the 14th century what about in the 17th century so do we think uh, wine was tolerated in the 17th century in iran so a picture says a thousand words so here's a picture so this is a picture of uh, 17th century persian court uh, the ruler was Shah Abbas, and you can see very clearly he's got a big um, container of wine in front of him. In fact, there's, there's, there's more than one. There's several, and uh, people are having a good time. There's music, there's dance. This is very different to how we might imagine. These are Muslims um, drinking, carousing, and having a great time together. I don't know if you want to come in on that at all. No, I mean, the, you're right. I don't need to say too much because it's all right there. It's right on the table. They have it in their hand. They're certainly drinking it. There seems to be no pro prohibition here in this painting, at least. Yeah. Um, so that was the 17th century. What about in the 20th century? So here we have Iran in the 1960s doing the twist to rock and roll music in Tehran. It's very relaxed back in the 1960s. Now, there's no wine here, but you can imagine if they're comfortable dancing like this, they're probably comfortable having a drink. Here are some um, students from Tehran in 1971, um, just being very westernized, really. Um, and then here's another picture. This is just before the revolution, a man having a glass of wine, probably with his, his friend. OK, so this was what life was like in Iran. People were very relaxed, had a glass of wine. Um, and 
1971, the, the leader of Iran was having a big banquet. This is October 1971. That's the Shah Reza Pahlavi, Shah Mohammed yeah. Reza Pahlavi. Very well yeah. known. Yeah. So it was the largest meeting of monarchs and heads of state in modern history. Um, the party was to celebrate the 2500th anniversary of the founding of the Persian Empire. And, and yes, he was the Shah Mohammed Reza Pahlavi. Um, and so right on the, the eve, essentially, of, of the Iranian revolution that happened to, well, eight, eight years later, you can see that the Iranian culture was very comfortable with the drinking of wine. Um, now, there would have been elements within Iranian uh, society, no doubt, who were not happy with this, which probably was the, the motivator to, that led to the Iranian revolution. So the question is, is this for Muslims an idealized past versus the reality of Iran's history? You know, Muslims often think about their past and think, well, you know, we were good Muslims all through the centuries. But the reality is that um, Iranians drank wine and drank other uh, alcoholic drinks right through the centuries. There were times when it was prohibited, but a lot of the time, even if it was prohibited, it, it was still happening. There were still vineyards right up to the late 1970s. Now, um, late 1970s, that would mean that um, for about 13, 14 centuries, there were vineyards in Iran. Now, some of them would have been owned by Jews and Christians, but not all of them. Um, there would have been Muslims who had their vineyards who were very relaxed about the rules. They would have chosen the verses in the Quran which supported the idea of drinking alcohol. And they would have ignored the ones that didn't. Um, and this was the accommodation that they had with wine. Um, so I think I pretty much have said that. No doubt some Muslims were strict on avoiding alcohol, but Iranians revered wine over the centuries. They learned by heart Hafez's poetry, which was as much an ode to wine as it was to love. They nurtured the vineyards over the centuries. They drunk the wine. They had fun. They preferred the humility of the Sufis to the starchy sanctimony of the purists. The Iranian revolution was an attempt by the hardliners to put an end to the fun. Extreme ideology and alcohol cannot coexist, so it was obviously important to get rid of alcohol. The Iranians had to forget their heritage, their poetry, their Persian culture, and most of all, their wine. Instead, they were given Puritanism, totalitarianism, and tyranny. I hope Iran uh, wins back its former glory. So that's my well, thanks so much, uh, Mel. This is fascinating. This is, uh, as usual, you always bring up historical antidotes. And here's what's good. I've asked you, and I've asked all the sin sifters to do what you've just done here. We have a strong Salafist, uh, very radical form of Islam that's pervasive, that's growing, and it's inculcating its viewpoint on the Muslim world. And unfortunately, we're getting that viewpoint that is being, that is being brought to the West. Probably uh, almost case after case after case, we have heard this idea that Islam eradicate uh, that Islam is against anything that is Western. They're against our dress codes. They're against our halal, our, our meat markets, and want to impose halal meat on all of our meat markets, our schools, our certainly the prisons and and the hospitals there in Britain. Islam also wants to, or Muslims, I should say, not Islam itself. Let's get it straight. Muslims want to also impose or eradicate or prohibit any use of alcohol in many of our Muslim contexts, in many of our Muslim enclaves. That's the case in Britain. I know when I was living in London, they would have these signs they would put around the posts, telephone poles. Here's, a, here's an example of them. And it's against drinking, against dancing, against pretty much uh, wearing wearing skirts that were too high, anything that was they thought was un-Islamic, which is a very right-wing viewpoint, a very Salafist viewpoint, a very right-wing idea of what uh, Islam stands for. Now, here's a case where what we're seeing today is much more radical and much more stringent than what has always been. Uh, Take, for instance, this something that I just put up about a week ago on the Hamlin University there in St. Paul's, Minnesota, where uh, this professor showed a picture of Muhammad and with his face uncovered. Perfectly legitimate thing to do because this is Islamic art. And she 
said beforehand that she would be showing this art if anybody would be offended by it don't come to this lecture or turn off the zoom camera for five minutes while she showed two pieces just two pieces of art here they are one with muhammad uh, with his face open and the other with muhammad with a mask a covering showing that between the 15th and the 16th century the first one is the 14th century excuse me and then by the 16th century they started covering up muhammad's face because that's where this was introduced this idea this prohibition of showing muhammad's face because they'd almost deified him that caused a huge fury the what the teacher was thrown off campus and i put up i helped uh not i put up i told people to sign a petition that was put together by christian uh, gruber and i it's over six thousand people now have now signed that petition if any of you want to do so you can do that as well here's the url i'll put it right below you so here is another case that you that you we have seen where the images and we did a whole what's fascinating because two weeks ago you and i did a whole thing on looking at islamic art didn't we yeah it's some time ago and i can't remember was it two weeks it's probably a bit longer than two two weeks ago well, but I films, you'll see yeah. it there. and we yeah. look at this evolution in islamic art from showing muhammad wholesale with his face uncovered doing with these great pieces of art not mocking him at all and then by the 16th century this was shut down and closed down so that today where is no longer permitted for people to show muhammad's face in any form and that's what we see now with wine today if you were to talk to any muslim and i've certainly had many discussions on this it is absolutely prohibited you do not touch wine because satan is the one that gave it it is satan's plan in chapter 5 verse 91 of the quran they always point to that so you aren't even to touch one drop of it now what's fascinating it says in chapter 2 verse 219 that we read earlier some benefit it is a benefit for some people i mean it admits that wine is a benefit much like what we see paul saying to timothy it is a benefit. And we have said study after study, even today, that shows that wine is actually good for you if drank, drunken in moderation. So the Quran admits that. It gives both positions. Today, however, you would only hear one position, only one idea. And so I think Muslims need to be careful because looks like the Islam of the 7th and 8th and ninth up until the 14th and 15th century is a different Islam than what we're seeing today. The Islam of the up until the 14th century, so let's say the first 700 years, the first 700 years of Islam is a much more benign, it's much more reflective of the culture around it. It has an awful lot of Christian, Jewish, Zoroastrian influence, as you showed in those slides right there, because Shiraz is right there in southwestern iran that was zoroastrian the zoroastrians had no problem with wine and therefore the the courts the you you looked at and you looked at uh the abbasids you looked at the umayyads they were drinking wine the abbasids they were drinking wine up until the 14th century they were drinking wine you even went to shah abbas in the 17th century he was drinking wine in his courts that beautiful picture you showed so obviously up until the 16th 17th century wine was quite readily available something happened then that shut it down and that's where we're seeing in almost every case in almost every instance there is a shutdown a radicalization a moving towards the right and it's this movement to the towards the right that is causing such havoc today around the world and also for muslims because it's making islam irrelevant for the western world irrelevant for the 21st century irrelevant for you and me muslims you need to be careful that what you're following is not really what your scripture is saying and is not what you first believe here again mel has brought up another example certainly in iran even up to the point of reza pahlavi the, the last king before before the ayatollah khomeini came and took it over in 1979 he was drinking wine and he was giving his wine to all the notaries who were coming to is to coming there to Tehran in 1971. Good stuff. I just want to add something there is the fact that I, I regularly meet Iranians and we go to the pub, we have a glass of wine, we sometimes have a beer, and these are the new generation coming up. There's a lot of Iranians who are young, who don't go along with the, the mullahs, they don't go along with the Iranian revolution. And as you probably have seen in the news, they are rebelling. Some of them are getting hung in Iran, particularly in relation to women's rights. So um, I don't want to kind of leave this um, with just the idea that the, the, 
the Iranian revolution has won. It's not over, folks. The young people are rebelling against that. They're looking for their freedom. They're looking to uh, reconnect with their um, Persian heritage. They don't want the extremism. They don't want to have their freedoms curtailed. So I just want to kind of raise it last to Iranians who are watching in support of them. So I just want okay. to finish with that. Thank you for that. Now, for this for this session and for this episode, what we're looking at is how Islam has evolved. What we're looking at is looking at the historical problems that do not reflect Islam today. Does not, or should I say, the Islam of today does not reflect reflect the Islam of the, of the past. Suggesting, as we've always said, that much of the standard Islamic narrative has all kinds of holes. Here's another one. We're going to go to another place, another country next. Are we not, Mel? Let's uh, do. Yes. Or I don't want to take, maybe we need to just be careful and not say anything because we want this to be a surprise as well. Yeah, let's leave it as a surprise, but it's at another significant place another significant that we're going to look at next. Another time of looking at alcohol. And what we're going to show is, folks, it's not just Iran that has this tradition. There's another country as well, a pretty significant country. Until that time, this is Mel and Jay. Over and out. Over and out.